don't call it ghetto fabulous just call it fabulous hello and welcome to here in la hollywood edition this is our third episode of talking to the people of hollywood earlier we chatted with lenora claire and then william g unforgettable interviews uh, go back and uh, check those out if you haven't heard them already. Today we meet a wonderful woman, a native Angelino, who grew up in and around Hollywood, Christine Ortega, who's a singer, a cemetery fan, and so much more. You know, let's let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Christina Ortega, and I'm an indigenous Chicana writer speaker, musician, humorist, and troublemaker. And I try to use my gifts to challenge the white supremacist status quo. I am the possible time-traveling love child of Emiliano Zapata and Dorothy Parker pending test results. We are in Hollywood with Christina. How do you pronounce your last name? Ortega. Ortega. (laughs) I am from Chicago. I know nothing about how to speak Spanish. Are you from Los Angeles? Born and raised, baby. Really? Yeah, born right here. Kaiser on Sunset. No kidding. Dude, seriously. What high school did you go to? I went to parochial schools. And then for the very last year of school, I went to John Marshall High. The famous John Marshall. The famous John Marshall Which has been in so many movies. Hot for Teacher, Van Halen video. I I know that the, um, the football field... Parts of Greece were filmed there. Yeah, my sister, my older sister was actually going there at that time. And I think actually bumped into John Travolta. Wow. Well, I mean, John Travolta still is an L.A. person. Yeah. You still might bump into him. You never know. (laughs) Parochial means a private school. Parish school. In your case, Catholic. Yeah. Did, um, Did Catholicism in L.A., Catholic school in L.A., Did that make you a more religious person or a less religious person? You know, I think being raised Roman Catholic anywhere makes you really Catholic. You really, it's, yeah, it's it's universal in that regard. I go to an Episcopal uh, church now in Koreatown, uh, First Congregational. Oh, that's, actually, that's not Episcopal. What is it? It's Congregational. What does that mean? That's the name of the denomination. They trace their roots to the pilgrims. That's why their school is called the Mayflower School. Yes. Yeah. With those creepy statues. Yeah, yeah. Have you have you played in there? Have you No, but I've gone there. It's a beautiful church. Beautiful yes. aesthetically, but it's if if I were to go to a church, that would be the church I would This visit. is how little I know about this church. Oh. Well, I went for maybe a year and then COVID hit. Yeah. And now I just watch it on YouTube every yeah, Sunday. Yeah. But I miss the communion. It's a it's a really cool church. If you're going to go to church, that's when I would give my stamp. Of Have you heard that organ in full? Oh, yeah. Do you know they do an organ crawl every year? <laughs> I've never heard such a thing. Oh, yeah. You, it's 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 a nominal amount of money. And of course, they didn't do it with covid. But at least once a year, they'll have an organ crawl, which is you actually get to walk and crawl around the mechanism of the machine. Of that particular of organ. Of that particular organ. See, this is this is where my head is in the gutter. I thought everybody brings booze. <laughs> like a pub crawl. You get yeah, you get to go to this church and then the next church and then the next church. Actually, listen. that's a fun idea. You want to expand <laughs> membership, listen to Tony Pierce on that idea. That organ I hear is the second largest organ in all the USA. Yes. The largest one is in a department store back east. Really? Isn't that crazy? It is the largest one in a church. Did you go to college? I did. Where'd you go to college? LA City College, right up the street. What? Yes, sir. Lots of famous people went there. Clint Eastwood, Charles Bukowski, Alvin Ailey, Frank Gehry. I heard that. Uh, Diana Canova went there. I started out as a film major there. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have an excellent film school there. Their cinema and TV arts is a fantastic program. But at some point, I found my way to the music department and realized these were my people. Let me ask you this, Christina. 
When Leonardo DiCaprio accepted his BAFTA award for The Revenant, he said in his speech, I didn't grow up in a, in a life of privilege. I grew up in a, a very rough neighborhood in East Los Angeles. Leo grew up in Echo Park, and then East Hollywood, and then Los Feliz. And he got a lot of criticism for that because that's not East LA. But when I moved here in 1984, this area was kind of East LA for people who weren't Latino. The furthest east that many of us would go would be maybe Vermont um, and Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, in fact, on Melrose near Vermont was a good punk club back then called the Anti Club. And that seemed so far away and a little rough. And so when some of us um, learned that there were gangs in Silver Lake and then Echo Park could be rough, I think I can understand why Leo DiCaprio thought that Silver Lake was East LA because that was as far east as a white guy would probably go. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's it's mind blowing to me still. You know, the thing about Echo Park, Silver Lake, you know, Las Feliz, this is my that's this is all my home turf. And you know, it's it's called Mila, Northeast LA. I'm okay with East Side. That's different from East Los Angeles. Okay. East LA is a distinct part of LA County. But the East Side is pretty much anything east of Vermont, in my opinion. Okay, it kind of is, you know, especially Northeast LA. So, yeah, you know, you if you're from Silver Lake, you used to tell people you were from East Hollywood because no one had even heard of Silver Lake at the time. And I remember a few years ago, I was leaving a club in Echo Park and I'm at a red light with friends and there's, we're in a car, but at the red light next to us is a blonde girl in a vintage dress and a ponytail sitting on a bike at the red light. And I remember going, saying this out loud to my friends, can you believe this? At night, a blonde chick on a bike in the middle of Echo Park. I cannot believe this. This neighborhood has changed. <laughs> <laughs> because when you were uh, a teenager, would you go to Echo Park? Yeah. At night? No. <laughs> <laughs> because of? I didn't want to die. <laughs> because no. there were gangs out there, right? Yeah, it was It was definitely. I mean, and yet I was running around Hollywood as a teenager. And honestly, now I think I am really lucky I'm alive. The things I saw and walked past and you know what used to, I used to do when I get ready to go out to see bands or whatever in Hollywood I would literally find singles and put them in my front pockets so as I walked down the boulevard and I was being panhandled I could just pull one here you go pull out another dollar here you go instead of stopping opening my purse pulling out a wallet so I actually planned on how to pan give to the panhandlers quickly so I could just give them some money and keep moving. Do you remember what clubs you would go to in Hollywood? Yes. Um, the Florentine Gardens. <sighs> that was one of the first places I ever danced in L.A. Oh, man. Great dance place. Still happening. Is it? Yes. Really? Not that often, but every now and then I will wow. see kids lining up. I loved I loved going to see uh, ska and reggae bands. Where did you see that? Well, at... Um, this notorious club on sunset called the on club which at that time my best friend was a chinese girl but her family came from jamaica yeah apparently there's chinese immigrants in jamaica and her family was one of them and so she and i would go to this club and i remember one time her uncle wanted to come with us and he's like, oh, yeah, there's this really good reggae band that they're from Kansas City, but they're really good. I'm like, really? OK. So we went with him. It was like, but the On Club was such a seedy place. It would let people, young kids like me and my best friend in as long as we were there with her uncle. Sunset in and what would you say? Well, this was closer to Silver Lake, the mm -hmm. On Club. But yeah, um, On Club, the building is still there, it's amazingly enough. More east than Akbar, would you say? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Closer to... Um, so like the Silver like, Lake Junk? Or Silver, Silver Lake Junction yeah, area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, okay. was, it was closer to where... Um, oh, what's that place I'm thinking of? Well, the Black Cat, maybe? Uh, Further east than that. Oh, so, so. Um, where... Uh, oh, it's near where um, Silver Sun Liquor Store is. Yes. Kind of near there, yeah. Uh, the uh, Silver Lake Lounge. Yeah. Area. yeah, 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 near there. 
Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. The building's still standing. It's, it was, it was a pretty amazing club. It was one of the, the second skankiest place I've ever stepped foot (laughs) into in my life. Okay. What was the first? The first, oh my God. (laughs) The first was, this was about 10 years ago. I went to see uh, a friend, she was new to doing stand up. So I went to see, see her perform at this, it was one of these venues. It wasn't a club per se. It was just one of these rooms and the guy kind of lived there, but he also was doing comedy shows out of his room. (laughs) And, you know, shout out to my friend, Frank Estrada, who I met that night and we're still friends. Um, I mean, this is how my friend and I talked about it when we left. I said, you know, I feel like I have to go get a t- tested for hepatitis after being in that room. And she's like, no kidding. I was like, I want to douse myself with Purell and burn my shoes when I get home. It was, she, we even thought, I think they film snuff films here. Like it was that gross. It was so disgusting. But you know, now I can wax nostalgic that that kind of Hollywood no longer exists. It's, it's been sanitized for our protection. Have you ever um, sang at uh, uh, El, uh, uh, what is this one right here? Um, I want to say El Cita, but it's not El Cita. Um, El Cid? El Cid. I have. What was that like? Oh, that I love El Cid. That's one of my favorite places in L.A. There's such a vibe there. There is. Such a genuine, historic, romantic, and mysterious vibe there. You know what? Oh, my God, I just remembered. The very first time that I ever sang in front of people that wasn't church was at El Cid. And you know how that happened? I was having Sunday brunch there with a priest. (laughs) I love that I actually have a story that I can start like that. (laughs) An Episcopal priest who was gay, but that's a whole other story. And he he and I were good friends and he, he was this young priest and I was such a goody two shoes and he bummed a cigarette from the people next to us and i was so mad i'm like you shouldn't be smoky and so he lights up takes a puff he goes i'll tell you what like the devil smoking a cigarette and making a deal for my soul he says i'll give up smoking if you'll get up and sing wow and i said okay fine and so i walked up to the band that was playing and it was this all-female jazz band and so i went up to them and i said um excuse me, um, can I sing something for you? Oh, sure, honey, what do you want to sing? So my favorite tape growing up was a tape of Ella Fitzgerald on one side and Nat King Cole on the other. You cannot have a better voice training than that. So I said, how about an Ella Fitzgerald song? And I named this song. And so they kicked it off right away. They knew it and I started singing. And then I realized that that song was part of a medley. So I only knew one verse. <laughs> and I said to the, I said to one of them, you said, said, I only know the one verse. She said, it's okay, honey, just repeat it. I'm like, okay. Like literally that was my first time singing secular music up in front of people because of a bet with an evil priest. <laughs> Evil, he brought he he sent you down the path of of music delight. He did. Now, I, one reason I love El Cid, and one reason I wanted to do this Hollywood podcast is nobody would think that that place even is a music place. If you're mm-hmm. driving down Sunset, you see the cool sign, mm-hmm. you probably think they sell tacos in there. Yeah, which I don't even think they do. No. <laughs> and then you go there and you start walking down those stairs, and you're like. What is this? And to your point about the story about the guy who um, had uh, comedy in his bedroom or whatever it was, yeah. his room, I kind of feel the same way about this, that they just kind of like figured out we could do something here. Yeah. What could we do here? And then they maybe, again, I bet you the real story is better than this story, but this story ain't bad. <laughs> 
They were like, well, let's make sure there's incredible tile. Let's make sure there's incredible ironwork. Let's put murals on the wall. Let's have an, a beautiful bar. Like, that's one of the most beautiful bars in it all really time. It really is. It really is. And yet, when you just drive by, when you walk by, when you see people talk about 10 coolest bars in L.A., it's never on the list. Fine. Fine by me. It's too cool to be on a cool list, right? I love walking down those stairs from sunset down into the place because they're so old and so naturally decrepit. You start to feel like, am I stoned or something? Am I loaded? Like these are like, I'm having a hard time navigating these stairs. It's it's like that. There was this uh, feature, I think at Knott's Berry Farm, it was this haunted room where everything was like tilted. That's what this going down those stairs is like. You just, you feel like your center of gravity is way off. So that starts the party right there. I did a thing for Los Angelino where I was trying to discover where the east side starts. And it was so fascinating because as far east as I would go, they would, people would always point more east. <laughs> so if I was in Hollywood, they'd say downtown. If I was in downtown, they would say, um, uh, uh, Brooklyn Avenue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I was on Brooklyn Avenue, they would say, keep going further east. And and when I was in Boyle Heights, near, a, oh, I, I think I asked the people in Guisados as well, um, where it was, I noticed that El Pollo Loco had a line. And I was like, we are in Boyle Heights. There's an El Pollo Loco there? Oh. On Cesar Chavez. Wow. And and I asked, I said, I asked a guy who owned a t uh, tattoo parlor. I was like, what is this? He goes, that's good ass chicken is what that is. <laughs> I go, but come on. This is like a cartoon show of what a Mexican place should be, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's just chicken, man. Yeah. You're, you're thinking too much. Yeah. And it's tasty. It's tasty. But I was like, there's not a mom and pop chicken place or in this neighborhood that is as good as that and he's like maybe but that's right there across the street that's probably what these people are thinking do you think that that non-latinos overthink things sometimes um about things like that i think just people in general we're creatures of not only habit but convenience and so if if it's easier and cheaper to get it from this place than that place that's where i'm gonna go you know, I want to recommend to you um, a podcast called The Racist Sandwich. <laughs> and they're all about food mm -hmm. and culture and racism and appropriation. I love it. It's great because food is such a benchmark for culture, yes. right? I mean, it's it's the heart of culture. So, yeah, I mean, if if this vato in the tattoo parlor had, say, his his you know Theo Pancho visiting him from Rosarita, and he wants to take him out, I don't think he'll take him to a pollo loco. Exactly. But for his quick lunch across the street, sure, why not? Uh, you said another word that I'm curious about, vato. Vato. Yeah. Is should a non Latino ever say that word? You can say it. It's okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what does it mean? Like, homie, Just neighbor. Just a dude? Yeah. Vato, ese. Okay. Yeah. I ask because um, uh, uh, the LA Times' columnist, uh, um, Gustavo uh, Arellano, Arellano, yeah. He, um, he mixes up, he, he does a lot of Spanglish in his tweets. Yeah. Which I love. Uh-huh. But as a black man... <laughs> who barely knew French, let alone Spanish, um, I don't know what's acceptable. And I don't want, I want to, I want to be a good neighbor. I want to be a good person, but I, and I don't want to offend anybody. Um, so I don't know. Well, I look at it this way. I mean, you've been here 20 years or so. I've been in Hollywood for 20 years. I've been in, in California since the 80s. Okay, so you're 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 as close to homegrown as it gets for a lot of people. <laughs> You've survived a number of earthquakes and riots. Yes. So yeah, and a friend of mine said it best. He said, "You know what? If you're from New York, I don't care who you are. You're a Jew. If you're from LA, you're Mexican, because it's a state of mind." And I totally agree with that. So. Embrace your inner Mexican, Tony. It's quite all right. So, vato means dude. Yeah. 
and that's okay for me too. Oh, totally. Uh, so if I so I'm going to the Dodger game um, uh, this weekend. Because, nice, because the Cubs are going to be in town. Ooh, and double blue. So uh, so if I see some vatos, it's okay to say. Yeah. Hey, check out these vatos. I mean, they might want to beat you up, but I don't know. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. Everybody at Dodger Stadium <laughs> wants to beat me up. It's okay. No. Oh, that's right. If you were, I had a pregnant yeah. lady uh, coming after me uh, a couple of years ago, <laughs> and I was like, "How do? What's the proper?" And the lady, the uh, the friend of mine who was with me was like, "The proper thing to do is to leave. <laughs> You're not going to win this confrontation." <laughs> probably seen a lot of gentrification i have what is there any good gentrification that you've seen in hollywood no to me especially for hollywood specifically the gentrification that's happened here is has been a homogenization process it's really sucked the soul out of hollywood hollywood still is a neighborhood and you having been a long time resonant you know it is a neighborhood but that neighborhood feeling has been diminished greatly it's it's become the the playground for p certain people and you know that's fine i get it you've got to have commerce you've got to have places for people to spend their money but the fact that los angeles notoriously has so little respect for like historic buildings and the history that goes with it I'm a big, I love historic buildings and historic architecture. And when you lose that, you lose a part of the soul, the identity of a neighborhood. So you take the, take these buildings down and build these flashy things and it it's just not the same. It becomes a theme park instead of a neighborhood. Are there any buildings that um, are top of mind in Hollywood that have been taken down? Well, I'll tell you one that I was amazed to recently find was still standing and it's in the 5,000 block of Hollywood Boulevard and it's the old Falcon studios of where Errol Flynn used to study fencing. I know where you're talking about. And I, I found that building when I was a teenager cause I'm, I'm always reading local history and I found that I was just walking down Hollywood Boulevard and I saw the, the tile in the ground in front of the doorway and it said Falcon and I froze and I go, no way. I felt like I was an archeological dig when I spotted it. And it was this tiny 1920s de kind of decrepit little building, so inconspicuous. And it just gave me chills standing there thinking of the people who walked across that threshold. That's what I love about local history. And about a year or so ago, I took a friend out and we were just out and about and I said, hey, I want to see if this building's still there. It's still standing. And now if you've been by recently, you notice there's actually in the alleyway next to it, a display n recognizing the history of that location. That really made me feel good. Even though it was a new flashy building next to it, they honored the history. And that building is still standing and I hope they never tear it down. This is uh, Hollywood Boulevard just west of Western. Yes. And maybe it was, um, because I think uh, either Garcetti or um, maybe whoever uh, uh, followed him, uh, um, there's some political offices there. Uh -huh. And so maybe because they were aware, maybe they knew, I can't tear down the next door historical thing, but maybe well, they could. I mean, it's never stopped us before, <laughs> you know? Well, well, kitty corner to that was... Um, that Thai, little Thai place on the corner that would have a hot dog, uh, had a hot dog, a uh, little, I don't want to say statue on top of it. Do you remember that one? Yes. At all? Yeah. Which is now, uh, I think, a pet co. Like, talk about gentrification. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are some great old restaurants there. I'll tell you this a great Hollywood story. When, because I went to Colorado for a few years, I went to school out there. And when I came back, I just wanted to kiss the ground. I didn't leave LA because I hated it. I just wanted to see what it was like to be somewhere else for a while. Because in Hollywood, you're always meeting people who come here. And even as a kid, I remember thinking, 
why do people keep coming here? I was so naive. Like, why do people leave their families, their friends, the, the town they grew up in? I just didn't understand that. Now that I've been around the country with my band, I get it now. I get why they come here as fast as they can get here. Let me ask you one question about Los Angelino um, Latinos. Should I call them Latinos? Should I call them Hispanics? What should I say? Should I say? Oy. What a and, topic. For, and for sure, you don't want to be called Latinx. True? I do not, personally, but that's a whole other story, too. Okay. First, number one, in my opinion, don't use Hispanic ever. Never use Hispanic. I hate it. I hate it. And a lot of other of my comadres and compadres hate it, too. What, what do you hate about it? Well, for one thing, Hispanic refers to Spain. Okay. And you're referring to who was our oppressor mm -hmm. for several hundred years. You know, it's like telling Irish people they're English. I don't think so. <laughs> and I can tell the look on my face is my classic Christina, homie don't play that look. Are there, are there Latinos that want to be called Hispanic? Probably, or don't care, don't think about it. And you know, for a while I used to like Hispanic, Latino, you know, Mexican American, I just feel like, okay, I know what you're trying to do for the sake of identification, fine. But you know, at this point, I'm all about reminding people that I'm indigenous. And it's interesting to talk to Mexican Americans specifically who are in denial of that. Not just white people, but my own brown kinfolk are in denial. Why of it. Why don't they want to take ownership? Um, I think it's just such a foreign concept to them. And, and that's part of what the white supremacy we've all been raised with has done to us. We've whitewashed our own brains and our own sense of belonging. Which blows my mind because what's this city called? What's, right. What are what, all these streets called? Right. Like if anybody... If anybody should feel ownership, yeah, it should be your people. Yeah, that's why I don't tolerate the bigotry that we see online on social media from people complaining about immigration, let alone calling it illegal or calling people illegals. I, I've literally said to people, it takes a lot of white balls <laughs> to stand on stolen land and bitch about immigration. Mm -hmm. That usually shuts them up. Yeah. Has there been a politician that you feel has been a good champion for uh, immigration and um, um, and your beliefs? No, no. Even the brown ones have disappointed in this regard. It's such a powder keg. It's it's become a football for both parties to bat it around. One is clearly anti-immigrant and the other pretends to be pro-immigrant but does nothing about it mm -hmm. it's and and a lot of brown politicians will sell us out for the sake of getting ahead and this this is nothing new unfortunately do you consider eric garcetti um a champion of Ugh. anybody nope <laughs> himself he's a champion of garcetti how do you feel when he speaks spanish not that excited. How do you I, I feel like it's pandering. I mean, fluent or not, the fact that you can speak Spanish just makes you more of a snake. It, it's more of a trick. If you're not going to serve, you know what? I don't care if you're a white man or not. If you're a white man who has a heart for people, all people, we'll be able to tell that. I don't need you to speak Spanish. Bernie Sanders, I'm pretty sure, speaks no Spanish, but I'd give that man a kidney if he needed one. You hear me, Bernie? I'd be honored. <laughs> if anything, I would feel like you should be more of a champion to people if you know their language that well. You would think. But again, with politicians, and I know there are some good politicians. I feel stupid saying that, though. It's like people who try to say, there are some good cops. <laughs> It's the same thing. Um, truly, the people who care about immigrants are the people who are sheltering them, feeding them, helping them find work, homes, health care. And, you know, that is something that I got from 
my Catholicism, I will say this. Talking about the poor and serving the poor is something that Catholics talk about. Absolutely. And that is important. And and I, I'll call them real Christians. Mm-hmm. Real Christians. Because Jesus was crystal clear about that. Yeah. The Couldn't poor, have been more clear. The poor will always be with you. And also, if you have two coats and you see someone with none, you give them one. How hard is that? You know... My mother and I did not have a great relationship, but I learned some good lessons from her even so. And one of them was she was coming out of uh, church and these two, you could tell, newly arrived Mexican men came up and asked her if she needed any work to be done. And she didn't have anything to hire them for, but she opened up her wallet and gave them whatever money she had. And she said, welcome, God bless you, take care of yourselves. I cried when that happened. I was so moved by that. I don't care how many times you go to mass. I don't care how big your church is. If you're not feeding and clothing the poor, everything else you say and do is, is empty. We have a sheriff with a uh, Latino last name. Yeah. Is he Latino? I don't know. I'll go ahead and assume that he is, but I also feel he's a pretty evil dude, pretty corrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's got to hurt. I hate to say that it kind of doesn't hurt because the last thing I'd ever want to call myself is cynical. I really don't want to be cynical. The fact that I get moved by things, even hurt by things, I take that as, you know what, that's a good sign, Christina. That means your heart has not turned to stone yet. So I'm okay with feeling my feelings. Hey, I'm Latina. You want to know how I feel? Just look at my face. I don't need a moon ring. That's my face. <laughs> well, I, I'll put it this way. In in uh, the, I don't want to call it the black community, but among black people, if when we see, when we see sellouts and we call them Uncle Toms, who are doing things, especially politically, that are uh, that they know are against what is best for their people. Yeah. Um, we lose our minds, and uh, and we can't believe it, especially when we thought they were on our side. And so I can't imagine a a black law enforcement person who, um, and they try to put this on Kamala Harris. They pro- they try to say, well, you know, she's a cop. She put as many black people in jail as the, the white people did, so you shouldn't really b- trust her either. Nope. And so... Um, who, by the way, she had the nerve to tell Central Americans don't come. She's the daughter of immigrants. Hello. Talk about hypocrisy. But go on. But maybe... But I... The way that I saw this was don't come right now because we're trying to work things out and we don't want to see you in cages. We don't want to see your kids separated from you. Should, am I being naive by looking at it that way? That's awfully generous and optimistic. <laughs> and I'm not saying you're necessarily wrong. Mm-hmm. Because right now we know at the border it's all messed up. It really is. We know they, they don't even know what to do with the people that got separated under Trump and and Lord knows Congress isn't really going to give them any answers. Well, the BBC just did a story on the conditions of the holding camp still. And nobody that I know who's a white liberal is talking about it because all they cared about was getting rid of Trump. Mm-hmm. And yet the same treatment is going on. That's what makes me enraged. Yeah. But to your point about does someone like Sheriff Villanueva, you know, cause me grief or disappointment? To me, this is an example, one of a million examples of why representation is only the tiniest bit of reward. Yeah, representation matters, but you have completely violated it if you are still a proponent of white supremacy and systemic racism. And the sheriff department most definitely is. When I hear about gangs in the sheriff's department, because, you know, they were also in the LAPD and still are. I mean, hello, one word for you, Rampart. Um, I look at Villanueva first as a cop before I think of him as kinfolk. He's a cop, plain and simple, and a very corrupt one. 
So to me, he's just another person perpetuating the violence that is law enforcement in this country. But and to your point about you know, don't live up to the stereotype. Sure, in terms of violence, like gangs, legit gang violence and stuff, that I can agree with. But all the other stuff about what you eat, how you dress, how you talk, where did you go to school? You know what, That's they call that respectability politics. And I, pers- I like anyone who is just gonna be themselves full on. <laughs> Persona en cualquier lugar sabe un cuento de amores que guardar dentro para recordar. Así se pasan los dolores cuando los días de su fiesta. Are you in a band right now? Currently, no. My I always say I'm on I'm retired, but Thankfully, people keep remembering me and asking for me to come back. And and I won't rule it out. I just feel like when it's time to come back, I will know it. And I'm not worried about it. I know I'm not going to forget how to kick ass on stage. <laughs> Let me ask you about Los Lobos. Yes. All time greatest band ever. Really? My opinion. Do you think that they're considered lesser than because they were popular? Not at all. No, they're they're heroes, and for damn good reason. Um, and you know their popularity, it's it's still not like like a Coldplay level of popularity. Not that that is what gives them cred. It's their musicianship. They're amazing musicians. You know, I once went to see them. Where was I? Was it at the Palace in Hollywood, on Vine? Mm-hmm. And you know what? I went with my mom. This is a great story. My mom doesn't, she didn't go out to stuff, but she loved Los Lobos. In fact, this goes back to a time in LA when Los Lobos were out playing on bills with bands like X and the Blasters. I remember one time my mom was in another room and she's like, Chris, come here. Los Blasters are on TV. (laughs) But anyhow, we went to see Los Lobos I believe at the palace and me being the kid, I had to get down in front straight up to the front of the mosh pit and, you know, rocking out to the show. And at one point I looked back to see where's my mom. Is she okay? She was further in the back, but I saw her with a cigarette in one hand. This is when you could still smoke in a venue cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other and bopping around. I'm like, ah, she's fine. But at that show, when Los Lobos jumped into Anselma, which is a ranchera, traditional song, very polka oriented, and this mohawked punk white kid next to me lost his shit. He went mad. He started slamming his fist on the stage. Yes, yes. And I remember looking at him like, what the hell? But I thought, all right, dude, you're cool. I get it. Right on. And again, that was a moment that crystallized this is what LA is about. You get the punkers losing their shit over a ranchera that's delivered with phenomenal musicianship. Let's talk about the ghosts of Hollywood. Ah, yes. I think Catholics believe in ghosts. Probably. I mean, the Holy Ghost, We right? believe in the Holy Ghost. Um, but the more I read the Bible, there's not a lot of ghosts in the Bible. But I'll tell you what, if you want to scare me, you tell me a ghost story. Sure. And in Hollywood, there's lots of haunted stories about this or that. Do you have some about Hollywood? Oh, I do. I do. Well, I remember pre-gentrified Hollywood Cemetery. Before before it became Hollywood Forever. Before before there was a... It was just the Hollywood Cemetery. Before there was a Ramon statue? Before there were Ramones buried there, before before the Toto statue. Um, Which, by the way, Toto's not even there. I know. It's just a st- statue Isn't that a rip-off? Of him. Yeah. So that probably is true gentrification. You know, they recently reinterred Judy Garland there. They brought her remains from New York. She would want. She would have wanted to be in Hollywood and That's not New York? That's what her family thought, so they brought her back here. That was just a few years ago, I think. So you remember going to the true Hollywood cemetery. When it was literally 
a disaster, a desolate zone. It was. Oh yeah, the grass was dead everywhere, weeds growing everywhere, that pond in the middle, brown and disgusting. No birds, no swans were hanging out there. And going exploring cemeteries is one of my favorite things. Is I'm it really? Weird. Oh yeah, I'm a cemetery geek. And I remember hanging around the cemetery with a friend and my constant thing was, you know what? Someday when I grow up and I have a lot of money, I'm going to buy this place and fix it up because I could see how beautiful it was. And I could, you know, the history there is incomparable. And someone beat me to it. Somebody, some white dude got money before me (laughs) and bought it. Thank God for him. But hats off to him, you know. I was just thinking the other day, I know it's a little too soon, but I should find a plot for myself there because you know what? Where else would I want to spend eternity but the coolest place where they have concerts, movies, music, you know? I mean, come on. And and it's all dolled up now. It's beautiful. It's actually very beautifully restored. When I was, you know, a teenager walking around, imagining that someday I would own this place, and we found ourselves inside the mausoleum where Rudolph Valentino is buried. And one of my friends, this was actually had a really big impact on me. And she said, hey, the acoustics in here are great. Why don't you sing something? And so I did. And I sang Ave Maria in front of Valentino's crypt. And while I was singing, I thought I heard another voice singing with me, but we were the only ones in the mausoleum. And as we were leaving the mausoleum, a woman came up to me. She was outside. She's just older woman. And she actually was wearing all black, but she said, I want you to keep singing. And you know that And there was just something about her. She seemed like somebody from another time. I don't know what it was. It was just, I I don't know, maybe it was just the fact that we were at Valentino's Crypt, that we were at a cemetery, and this lady's wearing all black, which in L.A. is a real commitment to style because it's so hot here. Um, And she was too old to be a goth kid. So she said, I want you to keep singing. And it the way she said it to me, it felt almost like a command, like, I actually feel like that was one of the moments that made me think I should become a singer. So that's just one of many reasons why that cemetery has a special place in my heart. I feel like this woman was from another time and was basically speaking out to the gift that I couldn't acknowledge yet. So I love it. That's one of my ghost stories. Christina, thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you, Tony. It was my pleasure. Isn't that beautiful? Here in LA is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and the miraculous Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Songs by Orgone and Jordan Katz. Thank you so much for listening to us. We put out new episodes every Monday and Thursday, and we have a detailed corresponding blog post that goes with each interview and can be found at hereinla.com. Ma, we got a dot com. Special thanks to Cindy for creating the logo. Special thanks to Jen Adams for inspiring me to do this in Kim and Oz's backyard. Shout out to Jordan for joining forces with me and really making this happen. Also shout out to Jason D for inspiring me to get the dot com. Mool Grusto. <laughs> what? Thank you to El Cid for being incredible. And of course, shout out to Los Lobos for being so wonderful and so much more than just a band from East LA. People are asking how they can help support this podcast. And thank you. Uh, all that will happen soon. But if you insist on having an ad in the next episode, you can. And you can email me at Tony at TonyPierce.com. Adios from Hollywood, vatos!